they want to own everything about you. They want to own the way that you think. They want to own all of your behavior. And they sure as hell want to own who you decide you're going to love. The more middlemen you put in between you and your opinion or what you know is right, the more skewed the message gets. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, but they never teach you to love yourself. When you try to shove people into a mold that they are never going to fit, it's the, it's the recipe for anything between abject misery and sociopathy. Welcome to Unbound, a podcast for new atheists and lifetime atheists, ex-evangelicals, truth seekers, and free thinkers. There is life after faith. And life here is good. It's time for a new perspective and a better conversation. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And, and it's, it's time to get unbound. Don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with women who do. Leave some room for the Holy Spirit. Ladies, fingertip length shorts and skirts only. Okay? Yes. Absolutely At least. nothing. At least. At, At least. least. And the longer the better, but above the knee is fine because we still want to see your legs. Of course. What was that movie that you saw last week and rated? Ooh, I hope it wasn't rated R. That's, that's not just some kind bad. of that's not some kind of secular novel you're reading there, is it? Oh yeah. It's like why are you watching that on TV? That is not godly. That actually was said to me by my college roommate. Oh, I, I heard it many, many times myself. Um, welcome to Unbound. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And tonight we're going to be delving into the wild, wild world of Christian morality and why it's toxic, why you should ignore it, and why you should be your own moral compass. Yes. But before that, a little bit of housekeeping. Let's just make sure everybody knows where to find us. I found over the last couple of weeks that if I just trunk this down to one source, we're getting a lot more traffic and we're getting a lot more uh, new listeners, new downloads. So I'm just going to say, find us at getunbound.org. That's get-unbound.org. You'll find links to our Patreon account there. And if you are so inclined, go ahead and drop us a five spot and help us keep the word going. I really just want to get right into things and... Um, because I know Shell's got some really good stuff for our Christians Behaving Badly segment before we get into the main segment, which I'm really, really excited about. So I'm going to hand it over to my co-host for a few minutes, and she's got a few um, wonderful, wonderful stories to tell you this week. Um, the yeah, problem wonderful. is that so it's either feast or famine sometimes, and to, it, it, it has been a literal buffet of Christians behaving badly because they're all behaving badly. Of course I mean, they are. Nobody, it's like they just seem like they are bound and determined to prove that they cannot get coronavirus because they are children of God. And uh, what are some examples of this? What are these idiots doing or well, not doing? Um, Rodney Howard Brown decided to say, we can't get coronavirus and you should be brave because we're, ri we're raising up revivalists, not pansies. Like, um, what is this, 1956? How do you define a dead revivalist? Mm, dead revivalist. You, they're just dead. They're just dead. They're not anything anymore. And as it turns out, um, they'll Jim, be pushing up some pansies. They'll be pushing up daisies. There you go. <laughs> um. As it turns out, Jim Baker has seemed to learn a, his lesson. He Now whenever he's peddling his health cures or anything else on his show, there is a disclaimer right on the screen. This has not been proven to treat or cure any illnesses. I don't know how he got away with not. I don't either. It's because he does not have as big an umbrella as he used to. I mean, he's not with PT. I mean, he's not with. But that's my point, though. Yeah. That that's my point is that he's not really in the public eye anymore. No. He's not one of these people um, that can just get away with this sort of thing. I mean, a lot of people still know him. He's definitely got his niche following, but I have no idea how he got away with it for this long. I'm just thankful yeah. that the U.S. Attorney General did something about it. Yeah, As so am I. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that people are calling him to account for his actions. 
more or less. Um, it's just his words and his actions are harmful and toxic. Yeah, both of those things are harmful and toxic, and, me, and even more so when they're coming from the same source. Yes. Um, right-wing pastor Perry Stone suggests that it's not a coincidence that states with political leaders who oppose Trump are experiencing large coronavirus outbreaks, while Trump-supporting states are not. But most of the Trump-supporting states are in the middle of the country. Exactly. They're less populated. There are fewer people in close proximity to one another. Of course, those numbers are going to be lower. But start talking about things like math and science to these people, and, I mean, you, you might as well be talking to a brick wall. Right. There is a new author of... Christian fiction, who was on who else but Jim Baker's show, warning that the uh, coronavirus could give rise to the Antichrist. Of course it can. Uh, what's what's his uh, what's his theory? Um, it just says that. Does anybody because... really want to hear this? Okay. No, it All right, just, go ahead, go ahead. Because of the collapse of civilization, there will be somebody who will rise up and be, get all the power and attention. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen because, no. Why would that happen right after your guy gets into the presidency? Why would that happen, like, now? But, no, he's just peddling. It's a talking point. They have yeah. something to talk about. So they're just going to pounce on it. They're not going to have any semblance of continuity with the rest of their message when they come out with this shit. Yeah. They're just going to start spouting shit because yes. now they have a foundation for it. Right. And it's just really gross to me. I mean, it's just, it's disgusting. How else can I say it? These people are all going around shaking hands with each other and getting real close to each other and... In defiance of any edicts. At the behest of their spiritual leaders. Right. Because they can't get coronavirus because they're children of God. And I'm like, yeah, right. Tell that to those other children of God who keep dying. Yeah. I mean, I keep hearing some of those old praise songs going through my head. Uh, like, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. All uh -huh. those who rise up against me will fall. I do not care what the devil may bring me. I am a servant of God. Yes. Okay. The sheer arrogance of that should be enough for anyone who's on the fence to see just where they'd be headed if they teetered over to the wrong side. Um, it amazes me. the Just the levels, the mm -hmm. levels of the things that they say that they hate the most. Pride, arrogance, self-importance. It is incredible to me how these people can sit there in the middle or stand there behind their fucking pulpits in the middle of a global crisis and tell their sheep, their bleeding sheep who are just going to sit there and listen to them and do as they're told that there's nothing to this, that it's okay to have contact with each other. It's okay to keep coming to church. We're safe here. Yes. And it just, it, it boggles my mind that they have to know, they have to know that that is not true. They have to understand this. And yet, and yet, they keep telling people to come together, to not forsake the gathering together of the brethren in fellowship. Well, what happens when there are no brethren left? Yeah. What then? Yeah, um, and Kenneth Copeland has said that God told him that the corona outbreak will be over soon because Christian people all over this country praying have overwhelmed it. They've like, overwhelmed the virus with their prayers. Right. Okay. So where are the hard numbers on that? Yeah. Where I'd is like he to, getting this? God. From God. He has heard from the Almighty. In other words, from inside his own addled brain. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And not a credible know, source. There are so many of these stories out there right now that after a while it gets redundant. It's like they're all saying this stuff. And I'm like, why? Why are you doing this? They use different parts of it. Right. They they find something. They find that single pain point yeah. that they can just zero in on. And that's their ministry for the next three to six months. Yeah. Until this thing just starts to dissipate. That's going to be their thing for yeah. the, the next three to six months this is going to be the, the subject of pretty much 
every sermon on every in every I I'm not I don't want to speak in in superlatives. It's going to be the subject of a lot of sermons. Yes. And it's going to be the source of a lot of panic. And worse than panic. Yeah. It's going to be the source of a lot of complacency. Mhm. And you know what? Complacency is what got us here in the first place. Yes. You know, it's not just, I don't care if I get sick. There, there, a lot of attitudes are like, I don't care if I get sick. It's like, it's not just you. You could spread it. Even if you have no symptoms, you could spread it to other people. That's, yeah. And we were talking about this at work a couple of days ago. And in the context of things like flu shots also, because I have one coworker who put it real eloquently, and I've heard it since, but... Um, I like the way that she put it. She's like, you don't get a flu shot for you. You get a flu shot for your family, for your coworkers, for Mm -hmm. everyone who's going to come into contact with you. Yes. And it's the same thing with this. You don't sanitize your hands so that you don't get this. You sanitize your hands so you don't spread it. Right. Because if it just gets on your hands, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to get it. But as soon as you touch something or someone and it gets on them, they could. And that's why we need to be vigilant. Yeah. It has nothing to do, well, it has everything to do with me because I don't want to contract this thing either. But it has a whole lot more to do with the people around me and making sure that we all stay safe. And with all due respect, it seems to me like that's a whole hell of a lot more Christian Yeah. than telling people to keep coming to church during a global pandemic. Right. In real life, in my life, I have a friend on Facebook, old longtime friend, who has um, POTS. It's a type of um, a blood pressure disorder. I forget what all is involved in it, but I know that she ha- is very in- in- immunocompromised. That's Immune a hard... Immunocompromised. Immunocompromised. Yeah, there we go. And... Uh, she got a knock on her door from a Jehovah's Witness the other day. So finally, they just said, okay, we're going to put up this sign. And they had this big, bright red sign saying, we are self-quarantining. We will not come to the door. If you knock, we won't answer. Please go away because we just want to be left alone because, yeah, they could die. But these people have a mission and a mandate. Yeah, well. And they're supposed to do this. Guru, their mandate. Precisely. People are dying. Yes. And my good friends, people I love, could get this and die. You want to save people? Stay the fuck away from them for a few weeks. Yes. Just That's going to save home. them. Not your words, not your scriptures, not the laying on of hands, especially not now. Right. Stay away. I mean, I'm not saying don't have any contact with anyone. I'm saying be smart. And being in a room with that many people during a global pandemic is simply not smart. Start using your intellect a little bit. This is why you are listening to this show. And understand what the ramifications are. Don't, I'm just going to flat out say it, ignore your pastor on this one. Yeah. He's flat out wrong. If he has not canceled church, he is flat out out wrong and he is doing harm yeah period end of story it is just that simple forsake the gathering for a couple of weeks the brethren will get over it and on that happy note onward into our main topic so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about well a lot we're going to talk a lot about the subject (laughs) of morality what it looks like in the evangelical world and what it looks like and should look like in the real world. This one is a real bone of contention for me because I saw lives ruined over just the craziest things. Mm -hmm. Um, People being told that they need to conform to this model of morality that just, it, it flat out fails to take into consideration that these are human beings we're talking about. Yeah. It fails to take into consideration that certain things about us are so ingrained that they're practically in our DNA and probably are in our DNA. Mm. And, you know, you can't change eons of human nature right. by simply writing rules. Because as I've said many times before, people are going to do what they want 
anyway. Yeah. And it really is that simple. So you can write all the rules that you want into your faith. People who don't like the rules are just going to break them. The difference is that if they weren't in that kind of a setting, there would probably be less that they would have to hide. As a matter of fact, I'm reasonably certain there would be considerably less yeah. that they would have to hide because just having control over your own thoughts, your own actions, and recognizing that it isn't about sin. But before we do that, I have a tendency to just hit the ground running here, and I want to hear from our co-host just a little bit about the transition from the Episcopal Church into evangelical thinking. Like, were there differences, similarities? Were there things that had heavier emphases on one side or the other? And, you know, just talk to us a little bit about what you were told about what and who you were supposed to be if you wanted to be part of this club. Right. Um, well, in the Episcopal Church and in the youth group where I was, people were generally allowed to be themselves. We went on hikes. We did stuff like that. There were a couple of retreats that we did, not whole weekends. I don't remember going off on a weekend retreat or anything with the Episcopal Church. And as for the evangelical, when I when I changed, when I went to evangelical church, when I when I went to the Assemblies of God, it was gradual, because in the youth group we were generally pretty much, you know, from all walks of life. A lot of kids who went to our youth group did not go to our church. So it was just, it was a little bit more free form. We weren't really condemning anyone for any specific thing. It was just, it was really not like that. When I got all of the real skinny on this was when I went away to college because then I was immersed in Assemblies of God doctrine, like all the time, 24-7. I mean, before that, it was mainly just, okay, you know, boys and girls need to have their shorts be longer than their fingertips. There weren't a lot of boy things. I didn't notice them because there I was far more... Fewer. Yeah. But, you know, girls couldn't wear spaghetti straps or tank tops. You had to wear a shirt over it. You had to wear a shirt over your bathing suit. And you couldn't have skirts or shorts that were shorter than your fingertips when your arm was down by your side. Right. Yeah, that's, so. what, that's what fingertip length means. And before I left for Word of Life, I had no idea yeah. what that meant. But they were definitely a little bit more lenient with the boys than they were with the girls. Yeah. Um, but they But they did police us. They made sure that we complied. And if it was a matter of I didn't have any shorts with me that were – long enough and we're talking maybe a fraction of an inch they weren't going to have much of a problem with that but i do think and i i never witnessed one of these um uh one of these exchanges between like a counselor and one of the girls but i'd be willing to put money on the fact that those those shorts had to be mm -hmm. had to be fingertip length i don't think that there was a whole lot of uh latitude there yeah and it's still very hard to find shorts that long for girls. Well, especially now. Oh, I yeah. mean, attire for younger women, we're talking about girls in high school and older, has become so sexualized yeah, it that has. it's difficult. And as a driving instructor, I have heard this many times from girls just driving around with me in the car about how difficult it is to simply find decent clothes. It is. Because everything is so hypersexualized now that it's difficult to maintain um it's difficult to maintain modesty. I almost didn't want to say the word because of what we're talking it's about. Very because charged. There's it it's so subjective. But I guess it kind of ties in because this is what these girls are thinking and this is their own morality at work. And they're saying that a lot of the clothes that are out there, uh, they're just not modest enough. For me. So I guess it works. I guess yeah. I guess in the context it works. But I really did stop short on that word. Yeah. Because it's a real hot button. It kind is of a word. hot button and word. I don't want to be perceived as trying to tell somebody what any of these things actually mean because they are very, very individual in nature. Yeah. Um, I also remember um I uh traveled with a traveling choir when I was in college. They told us to be careful about open-toed shoes and sandals because some of the churches were holiness churches 
where you couldn't even have open-toed sandals or or open-toed shoes. Just showing your toe and sandals. Or ankles, I think. With the um, Pentecostal holiness is what we're talking about, right? Yeah. And um, it depended. I think a lot, yeah, a lot of those girls wear floor-length jean skirts. Yeah, there were a few at one of the high schools that I did a lot of subbing at. Yeah. And there were a few girls that were Pentecostal holiness. And yeah, their their skirts basically almost dragged on the ground. Yes. But there there were also standards with the, with their dress that they couldn't just drag on the ground. Yeah. So there's there are all kinds of things. There, yeah. I mean, in, insanely meticulous rules yes. that these young girls need to follow. And it's like all the guys could pretty much just wear anything that they wanted because it was generally just guy clothing. Although I don't think that the holiness guys could wear shorts either. I think that was a problem. I don't remember, but, you know, I, I do believe that there was something yeah. about whether that was Pentecostal holiness or something else, yeah. Foursquare Gospel. I don't know. I, there, there are so many different sets of rules yes. for these puritanical groups. It's yeah. hard to keep them straight. And, and I would have, especially in college, because I really did have a witchy look around me. You kind of did. And I, they told me that you know, I landed on campus with my long, curly hair and my Indian scarves and my silver jewelry. And they were all like, you look like you're in the craft. But that's what kind of attracted me to you. Well, of course it was. You look different than a lot of the girls there. Yeah, because I couldn't look like them. Because I wasn't them. I was me. And I just, I couldn't see my way to wear the polyester dress. The polyester floral dress that they all had. And I was like, yeah, they, I can't. They, they were capable of looking like each other. You just didn't want to. That's what it no, was. No, I didn't want to. I never wanted to. And that was the funny thing is that I never wanted to. But in my heart, I was kind of like, I kind of want to because I don't feel like I fit. Yeah. And I never fit. No, neither of us ever really fit there. I have no idea how either of us made it four years and you four and a half. Yeah, I, I don't know either. It's because I didn't have enough self-esteem to realize that I was better than this. And that's because this religion relieves you. Yeah. Of your self-esteem. It is yeah. no longer I that liveth, but Christ which liveth within me. I yeah. am crucified with Christ and all of that happy horse shit. It's just, yeah. it, it's disgusting. I, I remember. And that's where this starts yeah. is with that. Um, and I remember I was reading, and I think it was on Twitter, that someone said, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, but they never teach you to love yourself. You're always, you're self-loathing, and you you don't really get the fact that you're treating other people the way you are treating yourself. It's very strange. It's a very strange mindset because you really aren't taught to love yourself. That's true. And, I mean, look at what was going on in this house last year. Yeah. Second half of last year. And what... Uh, what the causes were of all of that and it had everything to do with me just not even having the ability to like myself let right. alone love myself anymore at least appreciate yourself right. i've at least reached a point where i can say i like me yes and i've reached a point where i've reconciled most of the pieces of my personality and we work well together but there's there's still there is still that that nagging in the background that goes all the way back to all of this yeah. that convinces me that I'm not good enough. And if I'm suffering in any way, shape or form in some way, I deserve it. Yeah. And that was a lot. That of was a lot. What of was going on last year yeah. was that I just didn't think that I was good enough. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that I was worthy to even look myself in the mirror and like what I was seeing. Right. And, when that happens, it just starts to project to everyone around you. I have to tread lightly when I talk about specific circumstances, but I have encountered people in my life who it's obvious to me have had their thinking skewed into all kinds of tangents on the basis of a parent or another loved one or an abusive spouse or partner who have guilted them into believing that their actions are way, way worse than they actually are or were. 
And I saw this many times over. And I saw it in several key areas, most of which having to do with relationships and sex, but in other areas also, in areas of spirituality, in areas where, you know, you, there, there shouldn't be someone else deciding for you. Now, I mean, I was in college and working with Operation Rescue. Mm -hmm. because it was what I thought was right at the time. Right. But there was a part of me that always knew that the pro-life agenda was very, very flawed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It amazes me how they can sneak this thinking in under the radar. We've talked about this with music. We've talked about it with, um, with prosperity doctrine and word of faith. But they can do this with anything, mm -hmm. okay? They can slip their moral code into anything and get you to start thinking in a certain direction without you even realizing you're doing it. Because there was a part of me that always thought that the pro-life movement was really, really wrong about a lot of things. And yet I still stood there with that sign. Yeah. You know, that's because I believed at the time that I was saving lives. I was promoting births. Right. But there was nothing that I could do to save those children's lives if they were born to parents who couldn't take care of them mm -hmm. or would abuse them or had really, really, really bad either mental or physical maladies mm -hmm. that would keep them from having a life in the first place. My thinking on this has gone back and forth many, many times over the years as to whether or not we should be adhering to certain codes when it comes to things like abortion. But at the same time, I also have to remind myself that what I would do only applies to me, my partner, and my unborn child. I cannot impose my morality on someone else. If you decide that you're going to get an abortion because it's more convenient for you to not have a kid right now, that's between you and your conscience. I'm not going to sit there and judge you. You have your reasons. When you look at things from various perspectives, you could say that there are things that I've done that have been worse but that's from another person's perspective. And this is the problem with having one source to tell you what's moral and what's not. There are so many different variances in the way that people think about things, in the way that they view things, their perspectives on things. Just look at the average car accident and you know how different people's perspectives can be on things. Just take four witness accounts and there are going to be drastic differences in those accounts. So we look at everything differently than the person sitting next to us. And that includes morality. So regardless of what it is, unless it's something that society has already decided is a no-no, something like murder or rape or something that deprives someone else of their human rights in any way, shape or form. And that means their, their right to their body, their right to their life or their right to anything else. Then that's why we need laws and that's why we need rules. Right. Okay. The laws that exist are designed to keep us from needlessly hurting each other. Right. Because unfortunately, it's just in our nature to hurt each other. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it, it sounds very negative because we're also very capable of loving each other mm -hmm. and relating to each other in, in, in better ways, in different ways. But hurting is so much easier. Oh, yeah. And people engage in it all the time. They walk into an establishment, a place of business, and they're rude to the people that work there. They go about their, their business in a way that is in varying ways and to varying degrees dishonest. Here's a little bit of moralistic thinking for you. Okay, let, let's, 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 even, let's even phrase it as a question, okay? Is it morally wrong to drive 66 in a 65? <laughs> okay, Good now, question. the next time you're in the car with one of your evangelical friends and you head out on the highway... Um, bring this up to them when the, uh, when the needle goes to 66, right? You're supposed to obey the laws of the land, right? Well, the law is 65, not 66. So yeah. you are making a moral choice to disobey that law. Now it's nitpicky and it's stupid and no one's going to get pulled over for 66 in a 65. But at the same time, it makes a point. Because there are rules and there are moral codes within evangelical Christianity that are as ridiculous as getting pulled over for 66 and a 65. Right. There's a lot about the way they think and the zero-sum game that they make of morality 
that is just like that. Mm -hmm. It's nitpicky. It's not hurting anybody, but let's just create some conflict around it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's really what this all boils down to. I talked a little bit about Word of Life, and this was really my first foray into this world where I learned that there was a lot, a lot, a lot of do's and don'ts in this thing called Christianity. The very first night I'm sitting there and being told that salvation is a free gift, that all I have to do is tell Jesus that I want him in my life and in my heart, and I'll be saved forever. Period. End of story. That's the Baptist line. Two minutes later, I'm being told that there are more things that I have to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm being told that I have to go down to the front of that um, auditorium to the altar because I have to make a public confession. Is it a gift or isn't it? I mean, we already did a whole episode on this, but it, that was, I mean, that should have been, should have been the first thing that set off a red flag in my head. And it kind of was because I remember I questioned it after that they start heaping more and more and more on you. Even before they did the Jesus sales pitch with us on that Sunday night, they went over all of the rules. And honestly, the vast majority of these rules were designed to keep the boys and the girls separated, or at least to the extent that there was always like a third party around. So there was a rule about not traveling in twos, and that was same sex or opposite sex. There always had to be at least three people, okay? We already talked about the, the dress codes. Um, girls, short, well, girl, boys and girls. Shorts had to be fingertip length, and there were no two-piece bathing suits for, for the girls. And if that's all you brought, then yeah, you had to uh, wear a t-shirt. They were cool enough about this. They, they understood that there were people coming from different backgrounds. Right. And from different places in their life. So they were at least reasonable enough, if I remember correctly, to either get these girls um, T-shirts that were either cheap or free. They were also white. So, I mean, I, what's the point? I yeah, mean, right. At, at that stage of the game, whatever secret you're trying to keep is over anyway. <laughs> and um, there were other pretty stringent rules about your appearance and about, you know, the way that you would conduct yourself when you were dealing with the opposite sex, there was absolutely no physical contact. Right. Unless you were there as a counselor or you worked there and your spouse was there, oh, you were free to hold hands all you wanted. Mm -hmm. And believe me, the ones that had that freedom exercised it. Yeah. And they exercised it liberally <laughs> because all of a sudden they're special. Yeah. Let me tell you something. The first time I got to hold hands with a girl, it was really, really, really special. So I'm not going to downplay it. But, you know, if you've reached a point in your relationship where you're letting the whole world in on the fact that you guys are a couple, you really need to start practicing what you preach in terms of modesty. Mm -hmm. Because in that setting, you are causing your brother and or sister to stumble. You're showing them something that they don't have, that they can't have in this setting and all of a sudden what are you creating it's the whole hot stove analogy you tell the toddler not to touch the hot stove and what does the toddler do he touches the hot stove okay so when you've got a teenage boy and you're telling him not to touch the girl <laughs> and then you're showing him examples of someone else touching the girl and now all he can think about is touching the girl that he likes where are you going with that where are you headed with it Mm. what's what is what's the uh, what's the message that you're trying to send by doing these things in front of people who are being deprived of it people who are just hitting puberty and just waking up sexually and this looks like one of the most amazing things that could happen between them and another person is to be able to hold their hand but they're not allowed to do it here ah but we are so let's just flaunt it a little bit mm. okay you want to talk about modesty then you know what? Follow your own rules. Yeah. And follow your own scripture. Don't cause your fellow Christians to stumble. Mm -hmm. Because that's all you're doing, especially when you're dealing with a bunch of horny 13 to 18 year olds. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then you put them in, in this place where there's going to be a lot of skin showing no matter what you want to do to, to cover it up. Um, I, I don't know about it. I don't know about anybody else, but I can certainly see a girl's legs through shorts. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
And when you're talking about pubescent boys, uh, that's all they really need. You know, they they yeah. need they need a rough idea. <laughs> and that's really all yeah. they need. Because with all due respect, at that age, a rough idea is most most of what they have anyway about about, you know, what a girl actually looks like. Right. OK, they've got a rough idea. And, you know, they get a little bit older. I, I, in this day and age, you see what it was different when I was 13. So I, I, I didn't have a, a smartphone yeah. that I could just pull up any kind of porn I wanted to. So maybe these days they probably have a little bit more than a rough idea. Then I, I would, I would, uh, I would wager <laughs> that these kids have seen more than we did. But that notwithstanding, having all of these stringent rules heaped upon you is only going to make you more curious mm -hmm. about what the big to do is about all of it. Right. As a teenager. And being in that environment, I don't think I ever reached a point where I was crushing on anyone at camp. Um, I did go up there the first time because a girl that I liked was going to, but you know, it was a different sort of thing. It was just, it, it wasn't like a boyfriend, girlfriend sort of thing that I could see happening between us. I don't recall ever encountering anyone at camp that I even would have had the strong driving urge to hold hands with anyway. Right. But I did find it irksome that there were people there that did this in front of us. Well, this is what a healthy, godly relationship looks like. Great. If I'm supposed to keep it to myself, you need to keep it to yours. Yep. Public displays of affection were a no-no. But bathing suits were not. As long as they were one piece, uh, they didn't have to cover up. Right. So that was another thing. You're at the beach every single day, and you're looking at, at boys and girls are looking at all of, all of these bodies and lots of skin showing, and they're just being told, uh, 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 nope, nope, nope. Those, those urges, those impulses that you have, bad, just mm -hmm. bad, okay? You over here, you over here, leave room for the Holy Spirit, kids. And no, no physical contact of any kind. It wasn't even public display of affection. It was physical contact. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't walk up to a girl and put my finger on her forehead. I would get in trouble. Oh. No physical contact whatsoever. I mean, they seem to be okay with it between the girls. Boys, oh hell no. Mm. You see, this this was this was where where the disconnect was there. It's like I saw girls hugging all the time, yeah. hugging and touching all the time, and no one said boo about it. Right now, if a guy ran up to another guy and tried to hug him from behind or something like that, oh my god. No, I, and I did. I saw it happen. And the reaction to everyone around, regardless of what their ages were, whether they were campers, whether they were counselors, whoever, the reaction to it was so ghastly that I learned a few things about what they think about homosexuality there, too. Yeah. Even though it was never really touched on, we were simply informed that it was an, quote, abomination, and that was pretty much it. I mean... No one really dwelled on the subject of homosexuality at Word of Life. No. Um, there were a few passing references to it when they were talking about sexuality. They had the audacity to talk to us about sexuality and, mm -hmm. and, um, and all the craziness that went along with that. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later, but I want to keep moving on a little bit because this was just one summer. And I want to get into some of the other things and some of the differences that I saw like when I made the transition, not really transition, but once I came home from camp and started attending the Pentecostal youth group at Faith Assembly, I saw drastic differences. I saw boys and girls holding hands. I saw some smoochy woochy outside the <laughs> um, outside the the day school. I saw even after we moved to the the bigger building, there were areas on the property that if you came around that corner at just the right time and shined your headlights, you could see all kinds of shit happening. The point is that people are always going to simply do what they want. And the more of a taboo you make something, the more of a priority it becomes. States that have legalized marijuana have seen a decrease in teen use of marijuana. Why? Because it's starting to normalize. Yeah. Their parents use it for various reasons, whether it's recreational or medical. They know a lot of people who use it and use it responsibly. 
And it's something that you can now literally walk into a store and buy in a lot of places. It's starting to normalize. And in areas that have legalized, in states that have legalized it, there are all kinds of declines in things that would be considered morally wrong. Right. Declines in things like drunk driving. Right. Declines in domestic abuse. Declines in um, uh, dropout rates. Right. There have been all kinds of studies that show that people who get on medical marijuana have a tendency to do better, especially in high school. Um, when, when they get it a little bit younger and they're in like 10th or 11th grade, a lot of times it's precisely what they need to keep the anxiety at bay or to keep the ADHD at bay long enough for the right parts of their brain to focus on their work at school while they're at school. And I find this to be very true because, as I've said many times before, I'm pretty baked off my ass when I sit down to do this podcast. But you wouldn't know unless I told you because this stuff does not make you stupid. Right. It clarifies things like crazy when it's used the right way. And it has a very stabilizing effect when it's used the right way. So I'm getting off on another tangent because I want to talk about weed a little bit more too. But let's talk about Faith Assembly, that youth group, and what I saw. There was there there were all kinds of boy girl kind of activities that were happening um, behind the scenes and and in front of the scenes a lot of times too, where you know there there were impromptu makeout sessions in the back of the church van, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it was kind of egged on, and and some of it I think was a little bit more for show. But I even saw things at parties with yeah. uh, with some of my Christian friends that at the time made me a little uncomfortable, mostly because I wasn't getting any. And that really is that really is it. Um, I think I hit the nail on the head with that one, and I think a lot of people would agree with me. The vast majority of the problem that most evangelicals have with anything is their lack of access to it. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to have it, so they're just going to hate on anybody who does have it and they're going to talk down about it and they're going to talk down about the people and they're going to start name calling they're going to start labeling they're going to start doing all the things that evangelicals do when they see people out there just living lives and being happy yeah another thing that i really really liked about wicca and i'm going all over the place with this but there are so many places that my mind is going with it i'm letting it go just a little bit here mm. one of the things that i loved about wicca right was the fact that it had one rule and one rule only right the wiccan read it's longer than this it's a longer poem but most people will focus on this this couple of lines as being the heart and focus of the message where it says as it harms none do what you will right okay so what that tells me is that if I'm not hurting anyone with my actions, my actions are up to me. Right. Let's talk just for a second about the concept of sin. This is a man-made concept. It is open to all kinds of interpretations. And it is the most weaponized term in all of Christianity. I don't know if the concept of sin, if it's still called that, in other religions, I'm sure the concept exists, but I don't know what they call it. Right. Um, there are there there are right and wrong actions mm -hmm. that you have to be um, aware of and steer clear of in any religion. What they call these things, I don't know, but that it's all sin. Right. It all falls under the same cover. Now the problem here is that other people are deciding what is sin, and. In certain circumstances, the Catholic Church even goes as far as to differentiate between sins that are not so bad to sins that are that bad. Okay, <laughs> yeah. You have mortal sins and you have venial sins. Venial sins are the 66 and the 65 category. Okay, <laughs> Mortal sins are rape and murder. So you can see, you can see how far the pendulum swings here. Lying, um, you know... That, that sort of thing, uh, cheating on a test, whatever, a form of lying. Um, these cents. things, what's that? It's a 50 cent sin. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to do the Father Guido Sarducci thing. Where you um, pay for your sins. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you get to purgatory and then you have to pay for your sins. I, I like that, but I don't want to get into copyright issues. So yes, that's all I we're going to say Let's about it. We, we referenced okay. it because it was part of this. Okay. So please don't sue us. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's a funny way of expressing the opinion. But the the opinion is valid. Yes, it really is a valid opinion because it's just silly when you think about it. Someone else telling me what I can do with my life, regardless of what it is, and forget about the sexual stuff for a minute. Let's talk about being told what movies you can watch. Let's talk about being told what books you can read. Mm. Let's talk about being told who you can hang out with or who you can date. We're getting back into the sexual stuff. But yeah, let's talk about the clothes that you wear. Let's talk about someone else deciding for you what's modest. Mm. Let's talk about someone telling you whether or not you should wear earrings, whether you are male or female. First time I got my ear pierced, I was 27, okay? Because before then, it was just a no-no in every circle that I was part of. And when it became my choice, all of a sudden, it seemed like a good idea. When I didn't have anyone else to answer to, it seemed like a good idea. And at that point, I had met enough Christian men with all kinds of piercings to tell me that if Jesus was real, then he could still love me with an earring, Okay. Yeah. Or a tattoo. We had people that we went to college with that had tattoos. Yeah. And some of the most morally upright people that I know, some that I am still in contact with, one in particular had some really righteous ink. <laughs> and I know that this person had been told that he was going to hell because he had basically taken the mark of the beast. He defiled his body in a way that mm. cannot be undone, which is bullshit because it can. <laughs> but at the same time, it is supposed to be a permanent marking and it was intentional and it was sinful. Mm. Okay. Well, you know what? You don't want a tattoo. Don't fucking get one. There you go. I have four and I love them all. <laughs> Two of them are Wiccan and I still love them Yes, because they define who I was at that time in my life. I'm not stupid enough to get, you know, if, if, if things had been a little bit different, I wouldn't, I would not have been stupid enough to get a girl's name tattooed on me. Okay. <laughs> because there are some parts of your life that you do sort of want to skip over or yell do over about. So, but you know, Wicca wasn't one of them. And even if I had a couple of evangelical ones, because my attitude toward this was different back then too. But even if I had decided to start getting ink back then, and there were things on me that reminded me, it wouldn't bother me that much right? because it's still about me and about the things that I've been through. And they mean something. For good or for bad, they mean something. And that to me is the bottom line with my tattoos. I got two very, very wicked tattoos that express things that really aren't me anymore. But they were then. And they meant something to me then. And every single time I look at them in the mirror, I remember the good parts about that. There were some real shitty parts about it. Mm. I don't think about those. I think about what I went through, what I endured to get those tattoos. It's not comfortable. Right. And I think about how much I believed in it then to the point where I wanted it etched into my body and I wanted to feel it being etched into my body. I had such a passion about it. How do I look back at that and shame myself for it or regret it? Right. And, you know, to me, it's just that that was me then. Mm hmm. And you see, we're just bouncing all over the place with this. So I'm just going to decide that it's free form and try and keep the story in the background here. Right. High school years, you know, it was, it was a lot of the same shit, different Friday night. And there was some policing that went on, but it was a lot more permissive than an environment like Word of Life. Um, I even found that the Baptist youth groups that I had attended once or twice with certain people were a little bit more lax on this one too, where mm. the boys and the girls could hold hands around other youth members or in church or whatever. And there were, you know, it depended on who their parents were. Right. Okay. It had a lot more to do with who their parents were and what the parents thought about that than it did anything else. So keeping that in mind, wouldn't it also have to be more about, um, so if the parents are, in agreement that this kind of behavior is okay, it becomes okay within the context of those relationships, those two kids plus their parents. But there are almost always going to be people in that congregation that are going to disagree. Yeah. Okay. And there are going to be sideways glances. 
and all of a sudden certain kids aren't allowed to go to youth group anymore because they don't want to see Bobby and Susie holding hands mm. or they don't want their kids seeing Bobby and Susie holding hands. You see, this is where you start creating things like sociopathy. Right. Okay. It's, it starts in instances like this. So without going into real particulars, I'm going to, going to tell a little bit of my story. When I was um, a senior in high school, I was seeing this girl for a while and let's just say I've always been very good with words and we wrote some letters back and forth <laughs> and we were both very expressive <laughs> In these letters, I've since learned that you don't put shit in writing that you don't want to come back and bite you in the ass mm. because this really could have. And for reasons that I'm still I, I can't even to this day wrap my brain around. My mother gets angry at me a little bit because I still take such a casual approach to this. But the bottom line is we were both minors and the stuff that was being it, it was long before the days where you could be sending nudes on your phone. So there was none of that. OK. Most of what was in those letters was largely innocent, but, you know, things got more involved in the messaging over time, as they do. We got closer, we knew what each other's hot buttons were, and we pushed them. We pushed them a lot. We pushed them to the absolute limit. And, you know, we we stopped short of what Jesus would consider to be um, crossing the line, uh, that is to say that I was still technically a virgin on my wedding night based on the, uh, the the rules that I've pieced together in my own mind. But I mean, I don't <laughs> think either of us were completely untouched. No, of course not. We, we did our we did our thing with the people we were with before and with each other mm -hmm. before, you know, we put the toe right up to that line. <laughs> and, you know, about a week or so before the wedding, we started inching a little bit further toward for, further across that line just a little bit and things got a little bit more physical and it's like okay we're, we're on the cusp of this now so maybe we can do just a little bit more <laughs> and we did and it was fun and it was really nice and i had a little bit of guilt mm. about some stuff that you and i did right before but at that point it had been four years yeah. You know, thinking about it now with the head that I have now, with the brain that I have now, it was four years. Yeah. Who waits four years to sleep with somebody that they love? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it, it. Well, you know, a lot of people do. The answer is a lot of evangelicals do. Yeah. Our story is not unique. <laughs> I know many couples who at least purported to be virgins on their wedding night. Mm. And the ones that I knew well and felt like I could trust in terms of what they were telling me, their stories were all pretty much the same as yours and mine. Yeah. In terms of the types of things they engaged in, what happened as a result, all of the feelings, emotions, everything that they conjured up during that time before they were married and were allowed to just explore any way they wanted to. The stories are so similar. Yeah. Now, getting back to this relationship that I was in add to the mix very, very, very toxic evangelical parents who not only find these letters, but they, they go on the war path against both of us. Okay. The words and names that this girl was called by members of her family were reprehensible. And all it did was skew her view of what sexuality was. And I, I'm, I have no proof. So I can't even, I can't even point fingers and say that this is what happened, but I do know that there is a real propensity in situations like this in evangelical families to inflate the living shit out of what happened for the purpose of making the point that this was sinful what you did was bad, bad Christian, bad. And it does long-term damage. And I saw some of the damage that this did to this person. And I'm not even talking recently. I'm talking then. I'm talking just sitting there in her living room with her parents. Me, 17. She just turning 16. Yeah. Okay. And some of the things that these people had to say about some of the most normal teenage behavior 
was just, it was nutsy cuckoo. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, this is nutsy cuckoo. We've done nothing wrong here. And, but, you know, I also had it in the back of my head. Well, not even in the back of my head, because this is where my head was. I guess the thought in the back of my head was that it was nutsy cuckoo. But, you know, I did feel a certain degree of guilt because I also understood that we were definitely playing fast and loose with certain rules and that there were things that I'm certain that I wouldn't have wanted to get on the phone and talk to my youth pastor about. But here's the thing. That relationship didn't go on for very long. It was maybe seven, eight, nine months at, at the very longest, if, I'm, if I can remember it correctly. But boy, oh boy, did it have an impact on me. And I think part of the reason why it had such an impact on me was because I was never really able to reconcile what the fuck I did wrong there. Yeah. Because even knowing what I knew about evangelical doctrine, even after sitting through talk after talk after talk about sex, there were certain things that just simply didn't make sense to me. Two people who trust each other doing some very mild experimenting. What's wrong with it? We trusted each other. We cared about each other. It wasn't some kind of, you know, it, it, it wasn't a momentary thing. We had a connection that I think really could have been explored had it not been for the fact that she had people in her life that took this kind of a, of an extreme view of just normal teenage behavior. Yeah. And I mean, my mother had kind of gone off the deep end a little bit with all the evangelical stuff for a while. And as, as drunk on the Kool-Aid as she and her at that point, fiance were, they were summoned to a meeting with the with this girl's parents at which point it was being decided whether or not they were going to press charges against me that's how crazy this got and with all due respect i'm not going to go into specifics about what we did but i can only imagine that most teenagers have done more yeah i don't have eyes on their life or i'm not a fly on the wall in their house or in the back seat of their cars but just based on what I was able to observe as a teenager, what was going on in the hallways in my school, mm. what people allowed other people to see them doing out in public. I think it's a pretty good lock that what we did was really, really, really restrained and innocent. Yeah. Probably the most normal eight or nine months of my teenage existence. And it had to be, it had to be turned into something dirty yeah. with that in mind. And, and I, it still rattles me to think about this. Just what could have happened? I could have had to register as a sex offender for doing things that were just, you know, it, it, it just kid stuff. Yeah. You know, kids exploring their sexuality a little bit. And that was it. And, you know, the, the, the idea that these people were willing to ruin somebody's life over this kind of minutia, yeah. I don't think they would have been successful. Right. But the fact that they were willing to try and were threatening to do it over what was in these letters... It changed my thinking about this, but not in, in the direction of an evangelical way. After that experience, I took everything that these people tried to tell me about sex and my sexuality and how I should be managing my non-existent sex life. Hmm. Okay, I took all of it with a grain of salt because over time, less and less of it made sense. And along with that came the same kinds of doubts and questions about everything that they tried to tell me was moral. I could not figure out why I couldn't simply go and watch whatever movie I wanted. It's not like I hadn't heard those words before and it's not like I hadn't seen bare breasts before. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the worst you have to worry about in an R rated movie yeah. or a little bit of violence. Okay. Or sometimes a lot of violence, mm -hmm. but still, if I can handle watching that violence, then what difference does it make? If I'm not leaving the movie theater and going back to campus and, picking fights right then you know what's the big deal <sighs> and the funny thing is they never really had answers to those questions i posed a bunch of questions to that girl's father the day that he summoned me to their house after they'd had the meeting with with my mother and her fiance and i it, it still irks me that he was there but but without getting into specifics he saved my ass because what ended up happening is that the guys started talking man to man mm -hmm. and started 
reminiscing about things they did when they were teenagers. And it all started coming into perspective around that table. Yeah. So it was actually good that he was there at the time. I, I'm not going to say that it's still. At the time, it irked me. Um, when I think about it, that irksome feeling kind of turns up. But you know what? I should probably be grateful. I am. I am grateful that he yeah. was there to provide the male perspective because my father sure shit wasn't. Yeah. And, you know, and that, and that was the case most of my life anyway. But this guy actually did, he stepped up. Yeah. He stepped up and he made everyone at the table understand a thing or two about a thing or two. And it reminded me the way, the way that he um, described the conversation later on, it really reminded me, you were a big fan of Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. Okay. Remember there was that one episode where there was some, it was something about some of the boys were watching some of the girls bathing or one girl in particular bathing yeah. and the father caught them and started ranting and raving to whoever it was. It was the church board, the school board, whoever, whoever it was. But um, the consensus at the end of that was that boys will be boys. Yeah. Okay. So when a teenage girl comes on to a teenage boy, I'm sorry, the teenage boy is probably going to respond. Mm. If there's any kind of physical attraction, if there's any attraction whatsoever, because I've always been sapiosexual too. So yeah. that means that you kind of have to have a brain in your head and be able to carry a conversation if you're going to keep my interest. Right. And so this girl kind of had the full package. She would seemed more mature than average. She was able to carry a conversation. We enjoyed talking with yeah. each other and things just developed from there. In other words, things kind of were developing naturally the way that they should. But the more those feelings developed, the more it started coming up in both of our heads that there were things that we were doing wrong. But here's the thing. It wasn't a matter of we're doing something wrong and we should be afraid of God. It's we're doing something wrong and yet it feels good. And yet there are things about this that just don't jive with what we've been told it's supposed to feel like. Right. I mean, we're, we're, we're told all kinds of awful things about what our sexual feelings are supposed to feel like. Right. We're told all these things about what it's supposed to be like before and after you're married. Right. And we already talked about the fact that I had so much guilt heaped on me about just wanting to have that relationship with you that my body just shut down. Oh yeah. And it was a while before we could. Yeah. So that sense of conflict kept us from having that even after it was okay. My brain could not reconcile. This was wrong 24 hours ago. It's okay right now. Yeah. It couldn't do it. <laughs> and some of those past experiences, especially that one, yeah, they played a role. They oh, definitely sure. played a role because I mean, you find out that you're that, that somebody wants to uh, press charges against you for a little bit of heavy petting. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it's like you, you start understanding, at least from that perspective, the severity of this, at least in the minds of people that make the rules. Mm -hmm. And that sense of severity doesn't just go away for some. I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but that sense of severity doesn't just go away and allow you to open up your own perceptions to things and just explore and enjoy. Right. I've heard other varied tales that were kind of like this, but um, I mean, for the most part, people aren't going to admit to right. having problems like this. They're just going to talk about how great their honeymoon was and all mm -hmm. that. But, you know, I talked to more than a few that didn't have such a great honeymoon either. Yeah. And it all has to do with what they were taught about sex when they were young or before they were married and the do's and don'ts that were imposed on them. And, Again, those kinds of things permeate a lot of areas. I see. I don't want to leave this track right now. There's more. I want to see if I can remember at the end. Just a couple, couple of points at the end. I don't want to leave this part of it because I, I think that it's the part that does the most damage. Yeah. Okay. I think that the sexuality aspect of it and the lack of self-expression or yeah. self-understanding. Yeah. That comes along with this 
is one of the most harmful things. Yeah. And I've said before, if they can control you sexually, yeah. They, they got how you. how what else is there? You know, they they learn how to control your finances, they learn how to control your time, and then they learn how to control what goes on between your legs. Yeah. And once they've got that, they've got you. What else yeah. is there? What else is there at that point? So this is this is why it makes me so angry. Because of things that I've learned since, things about me that have changed, things about my thinking that have changed drastically about this. It's been a while yeah. since I've worried about whether or not someone was married if they were sleeping with each other. It's been a real long time since I bothered myself to think about the moral implications of two unmarried people having sex. Right. Okay, newsflash. Those of you who are still in this, those trying to get out, those recently out and trying to reconcile certain things in your head, let me tell you something. Having sex with someone that you're not married to is okay. <laughs> it's okay. You find somebody, you like them well enough, and you want to explore that part of the relationship with them, please just explore it. Please don't get into a situation where now you have a legally binding contract that is difficult to get out of when you figure out that you don't really like them that much. Yeah. Because I mean, I saw a lot of divorces after very short periods of time, less than five years because all of a sudden I heard the, the same thing more than once. I woke up one morning, I looked over at him or I looked over at her and realized I didn't know who the fuck they were. Yeah. And that, that's a problem because, and, and it was, that was us too. I mean, yeah. all, all the odds have always been stacked against us. <laughs> I have no idea how we've gotten from there to here and rolled with all the changes. I don't know. All I know is that it happened and then, and that I'm grateful. Stubbornness. But yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that can be varying degrees of problematic. Now there is always going to be the emotional aspect of it when a relationship ends, especially when it's been intimate, especially when you thought that there were things going on with that person that weren't, or maybe that you didn't know were, there are all kinds of variables, things that you learn as you get to know each other better. But if the sex thing is that much of an issue, then I don't understand why these people think it's more moral to just try and brush those feelings aside and not deal with them so that it's all you can think about. And now you're not thinking about whether or not you can live with the person. Right. Okay. I'm not saying that it's necessary. There definitely have been a lot of marriages that have been very successful where this person and this person have only ever slept with each other and they're happy. That's great if that's you, but that's not most people. Yeah. And certainly not people who are in their late teens, early 20s, late teens, yes, late teens, early 20s, and maybe even a little bit older. Because I know a lot of first marriages that failed and second marriages that were stellar. Because when that person remarried, when he or she was in their 30s, you know, their, their mid-ish 30s or so, they knew what they wanted. They knew themselves. They had enough autonomy and enough sense of self to recognize that, yes, I actually can live with this person. Oh, and most of them ditched the whole waiting for marriage thing the second time around, too. Just started having sex when they were ready to have sex, whether they were Christians or not. Mm. Okay? Most of the ones that I know simply decided that they were going to take their sexuality into their own hands because it was something that they needed to be sure about, too before they decided that they were going to put all their cards on the table with this one person. Yeah. And, but a lot of those second marriages work and a lot of those couples are happy because they've taken the time to understand a few things about themselves and what they want and expect from a partner. Right. These things are way, way more important than the timing and structure of things. Okay. Um, and it, to the extent that someone else is dictating the timing and structure. Okay, right. timing and structure is very important when it comes to you and your, your relationship and how you deal with that person. But the timing and structure of things when it's when, when you're following a script, that's, right. that's toxic. It's just, it's just plain toxic. You, you go back to the, uh, to the hot stove analogy, and now you've got people who have been deprived of any kind of sound education right. about sex or about their own sexuality. 
Right. And you and, and you take that and add it to the confusion of being a teenager and everything that's going on in your head and in your body at that time in your life. And guess what? Men stay in puberty well into their 20s. It's not over at 18 for guys. Yeah. Okay. Most will still be in puberty by age 22 or 23. In some extreme circumstances, it can last into a guy's 30s. Mm. Very, very, very rare, but it can. Now imagine having those hormones bouncing around in your head, not for about five or six years, but for 15. Okay. Now, Mm. I don't think that that was me per se, but I had a whole lot of different things going on inside my head. And one of the manifestations of this kind of thinking I think at the very beginning had a lot to do with how fast I would fall in love Mm. it happened more than once and it's happened since I've been married and there are other reasons for that that we might get into in another episode but I'm not gonna not gonna I'm not gonna explore me at this point as much as I'm gonna explore the concept and different people are just simply wired different ways now Christianity says that you have to com- you have to conform to this mold and this mold includes heterosexual monogamous relationships and that's that. Okay? Well, you know what? People relate to each other on a lot of different levels. They relate to each other sexually on a lot of different levels. This is in our nature. This is part of who we are. So forcing everybody's square peg into this round hole of evangelical thinking is toxic on so many levels because it just completely deprives the individual of the opportunity to be themselves. And this isn't the only area of life. They, they, they want to do this to your whole life. Oh, yeah. they, they want your mm-hmm. entire life to feel like this. But they zero in on this because it's the toughest thing to control. Right. I knew loads of Christians Christian teenagers, Christian adults, you name it, who were carrying on sexual relationships and were varying degrees of concern about the consequences of it. At the end of the day, and they know this, and I don't think if if they heard it, they they would be too offended me saying it, but at the end of the day, when my mother and her husband got married, they understood that they were doing something that was in direct violation of scripture because my father was still alive at the time. They even joked, um, well, well, not, not, I want to say joked, but you know, a little bit, a little bit of uh, gallows humor, I guess, over this once, once I found out that my father had passed and he had been gone for several years and that's a whole nother story. But I found out that he had passed and you know, my mother engaging in a necessary moment of gallows humor at that point looks at her husband and says, our marriage is legit now. I'm not an adulteress anymore. Oh, gee, that's great. <gasps> and But they said it in this in this way that it, it was obvious that they never believed it in the first place, but it's right there in black and white. Yeah. You know, it's right there for, and, and there are a few things in scripture that are that black and white. Mm-hmm. And they knew, and the pastor that married them knew. I think I've said this before. Um, but they, 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 they understood. They understood that they were following their own path with us and a lot of people follow their own path with with their with their feelings emotions and sexuality and just don't talk it up you know they don't they don't go public with what they're doing they keep their business their business and they just do what they what they want to do because that's what people are going to do anyway yeah people are always just going to do what feels right to them at the moment it's not even a matter of right and wrong it's what's most convenient you want to talk about convenience walking away from a relationship that Uh, that you you discover you don't like the other person, whether you've had sex with them or not, just being able to walk away and have it be either amicable or anything else in between, but not involving lawyers and not involving financial ruin and not involving your credit going to shit. Yeah. Okay. These are things that happen when you divorce and divorce is almost inevitable if you marry somebody because you want to have sex with them. So if you're in this right now, just hear what I just said. You got somebody in your life you want to have sex with. Um, you know what? I'm not going to tell you to start pressuring anyone into doing anything, but start thinking about how much sense it makes to to even think that you're going to wait four years to do anything with this person. Um, we waited, but 
it wasn't really a happy time because we both no. knew what we wanted. Mm-hmm. So the relationship survived. We are so atypical of most people <laughs> yeah. that were part of that that were part of that world. We were so atypical because we did a lot of the same things for a lot of the same reasons. I was actually excited about moving up our wedding date because it meant that I would be able to be with you sooner. Yeah. Oh, I know. And it was it was literally one of the first things in my mind. It's like number one, it's going to help me career wise, but number two, I'm going to get some. <laughs> you know, and that, that, there was that. <laughs> You're going to get you some. And uh, but that was it. Was a draw. It was it was a major major positive. And I mean, I will readily admit that there were things that I should have been thinking about that I that I wasn't that I didn't. And the sheer fact that we're still together is, I mean, it's, it's cosmic coincidence. It's sheer dumb luck. So, so many things should have gone wrong early on and didn't, Yeah. but you know, it's, it's always been, it's always been um, impressive to me how we shift along with each other. Yeah. That we've, we've always been very go with the flow and we've always kind of followed each other around. Yeah. But um, most people aren't like that. No, most people don't have that capacity. The ones that get married, because they meet somebody that they want to fuck. Mm. That's, you know, that, yeah. that they're, they're steering themselves down such a negative path. And we talk about sex being the thing that is the most harmful or the most hurtful thing about this. It's not the sex that's harmful or hurtful. It's what we build it up in our minds to be that determines whether or not it's going to be harmful or hurtful. There are plenty of people out there that have much, much healthier attitudes about sex, about their own sexuality. They can manage being with uh, multiple partners. They can manage really complex emotions and manage them efficiently. And you look at people like that and the average evangelical is just going to say, oh, well, they're just living in sin. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But what if their marriage or relationship, let's just call them relationships. Let's not put labels, okay? What if the relationship that they are in is actually happier than yours? What if they actually put some thought into whether or not they wanted to be with this person and wake up every day and have the option and the choice of whether or not they actually just want to be with that person? Yeah. I feel like it makes it a lot easier to be happy and satisfied when you don't feel shackled. Yeah. Okay. Now this is coming from two, what I would consider to be pretty successfully married people. <laughs> Those shackles can be very harmful. Some people need them. Yeah. Some people need to have that assurance that that other person is going to be there. Yeah. I don't fault anyone for getting married if they do it for the right reasons, mm -hmm. but I want to fuck you. Isn't one of them. No. No. But that's what a lot of this is about because they're not allowed to explore that part of themselves until they've got that chunk of gold on their finger. And now all of a sudden it's just magically okay. It was okay before, you know, yeah. try to get out of this mindset that there are prerequisites. You're going to have the experiences with your life that you're going to have on your own timeline. No one else's. Yeah. And if that's the case, then who really has the right to tell you what you do at that time? Mm -hmm. Who really has the right to tell you what you're going to do with your body? Who really has the right to tell you who you should and shouldn't love? Who really has the right to tell you what you need to do in order to make them happy? Yeah. It's time to start thinking about making you happy because mm -hmm. it matters. Yeah. It matters big time whether or not you are happy. So before I get into my, my final comments on this, I just want to pass it back over to you. Is there, is there anything going through your head that you want to share before I end this off? Um, I think that it is really harmful that people don't know or don't study about different types of relationships. And I think that People understanding about what kind of relationships and family structures are out there and what kind of alternate sexualities, you know, what yeah. kind of things are out there because it would have been good to know certain things. It would have been 
nice to know about non-binary people. I mean, it wasn't really a thing when I was growing up. But at the same time, I also knew people who were kind of like that. Yeah. There were people at Valley Forge like that. Yeah. Oh, there were a lot of, especially girls who just didn't wear girly clothes. Or, you know, and I think that a lot of times people looked at them weird. Oh, yeah. Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah. I I can think of a couple in particular that only lasted a couple semesters. And then they lit out of there because... They just couldn't find enough people there yeah. that would accept them. Right. Well, I had the same problem, but I stayed. I, it, you know, it all depends on what your motivation is. You know, yeah. the ones that left were the smart ones. The ones that left had a better handle at that time in their lives on their thought lives than and, I did. Yeah. I know that there were several guys of my acquaintance who definitely were gay. Oh, yeah. And covering or maybe they just got together with somebody and didn't realize it. And it's like, okay, what do I do now? Right. Yeah. You know, and I'm thinking mm-hmm. about two particular people. And oh, I'm like, mm-hmm. yep. I'm like, what did they do? Where do they go at this point? If they still believe, what kind of thing does that do to your head? You know, you know? I've, I've lost track of both of them. I don't know I don't if either know. of them are on social media. I have. I have actually looked. Yeah. I don't think that they're present. Either of them no. are very present out there. Yeah. But, you know, I, I certainly know who it is that you're, that you're talking about. And I feel for these guys in particular yeah. because there were all kinds of signs. Yeah. All kinds of things that I saw when we were still at Valley Forge that told me beyond any real reasonable doubt that these guys were gay. Right. And the fact that they had to not not just hide it, but deny it. They really I mean one of them had wasn't wasn't he a PK of someone yeah. that was that was pretty prominent? Oh, well, I don't know I don't know about prominent, but definitely a pastor's kid. Yeah, but I, I think this this guy's father had some at least slight degree of influence. Yeah, I'm not um, sure. You know, I'm I'm thinking about uh, who this was. Um and, and the last name. Because it was kind of a common-ish last name yeah. in in evangelical ministerial circles, mm. so there might have been a little bit more. Yeah. There might have been a little bit more there. Yeah. But I do remember one of them actually lived in my dorm, yeah. and there were all kinds of things. And you know the 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 response at that point was to be uncomfortable, and I have to admit that I was uncomfortable. I will even go on record and admit that the notion of gay sex makes me real uncomfortable. But that's because it's not something that I would want to do. Okay? Yeah. It has nothing to do. I mean, the, the idea of blood sausage makes me uncomfortable, too, because it's not <laughs> something I'd want to eat. But, um, but you know, it, it, I, I, look at, I look at other um, sexual orientations in the same way. Not everybody likes blood sausage. All right? There are some people who do. So just let them enjoy it. And, you know, just understand it's not on your plate, so it's not your problem. Okay? If yeah. these things aren't happening in your bedroom, they're not your problem. Right. Just let people love who they're going to love and let them do what they're going to do right. with the people that they love. Yes. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. No. Why there has to be this insistence on compliance with a specific, um, with a specific set of rules and codes and guidelines and, and mores. Why do these things have to exist in the first place? Because left to ourselves as human beings, yes, we absolutely need laws. We need governments. Mm -hmm. We need someone basically making sure that we're not just out there killing each other. But I think that at the end of the day, most people want more to be loved than they want to be horrible to each other. Right. Okay. I think that most people just want to be understood. I think most people want to be able to make their own decisions and their own choices. Yeah. And when you try to shove people into a mold that they are never going to fit, it's the it's the recipe for anything between abject misery and sociopathy. Yeah. If you're lucky, that person lives a quiet, miserable life. Yeah. If you're not, they wind up on the evening news. Yeah. Now, those are two real, real extremes and pretty much everybody falls somewhere in the middle where there's the whole quiet desperation thing of them trying to reconcile what they are 
with what the world expects them to be or what their church expects them to be. More to the point, the people where they find their acceptance. Mm -hmm. You know, you come out as gay in the middle of an evangelical church, there goes all of your acceptance right yeah. there. You just admit to being in a quote unquote what what's no what's the word I'm looking for? You you admit to you admit to being in a sexual relationship with someone that you are not married to. And you're in that kind of a setting. And all of a sudden, you're both being branded with a scarlet letter. But her <laughs> yeah. more than him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One prominent um, example from when we were in, in college. I can remember there was a girl that got pregnant. Mm -hmm. She was kicked out. He was allowed to stay. Yeah. You know? And that's that's another another part of this. The whole mm -hmm. The whole part of toxic masculinity mm. is another big problem here and this kind of thinking about this area of morality infects all kinds of male behavior because now you you're trying to tell uh, uh, as as a teenage boy okay i have no idea i have no idea how I didn't turn into this raging misogynistic pig mm. with the things that I went through. I have no clue how I managed to get my way past that and just think the way I think now. Or yeah. e even even back then, I think that my, my attitudes toward women were just slightly better than the average evangelical guy. Yeah. Okay? Oh, yeah. I think that my attitudes were in a place that, um, you know, I, 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 I feel like, I treated the the women that I had relationships with with a lot of respect. I feel like I treated them all well. Mm -hmm. And I never pushed any of them any further than they wanted to go sexually. I, and in most instances, you were a little bit more of an exception to the rule because you were more passive. Yeah. But I did a lot more playing along than I did, you know, right. trying to move things along on my own. I got a gauge for what she wanted and what she liked, and I just sort of ran with it. And that was the way that was my MO for a while. And, and I mean, with all due respect, it still is. Because even now I find as much satisfaction in you enjoying what we do. Yeah. As I do in, you know, what I get from it. Right. I enjoy what I what I put into it mm -hmm. as much as I enjoy what I get. Right. And that's that's always been the case for me and you know it for for some people that you know like it's for for some women that poses a problem because yeah. they're if they're in the same mindset and they just want to give and give and give it can come across as a little standoffish yeah. for someone like me to say well you know what i'm not that worried about that well you know what she is mm. so now you kind of have to find that balance and figure out where you two are going to meet in the middle and it's not always easy and especially for, for someone like me, you have very, very traditional wiring. Yeah, I am extremely traditionally wired. Very traditional wiring with your sexuality. Yeah. I am not. Yes. By any definition, traditional in the way that my brain thinks about love and sex. It's just that simple. We have very, very different ways of defining these things in our heads. We have very different definitions of what relationships are and what they look like and what they can be, should be, should be allowed to be. Our, our brain processes these things differently. Not that we have differences of opinion, right. but just that we have different perspectives, drastically different perspectives on certain things. And yet we still manage to work within each other's frameworks. Right. Why? Why do you suppose that is? Because we love each other. And Bingo. Because we think about each other and we want to make sure that everybody is happy because this has always been one of those relationships where there's been give on both sides okay neither of us are takers in this relationship and that's why i think things work so well because each of us has this desire for the other one to be happy and that desire for the other one to be happy it, it basically just bounces back and forth you know yeah. and and we find a place to meet in the middle and we've generally been happy. Okay. Um, when I'm not happy or when you're not happy, then things need to be talked about. Right. They need to be sussed out between the two of us. We don't need to open the Bible. No. And get the perspective of bronze age humans who 
basically hated women. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Because any discussion that we're going to have based on anything biblical is always going to come out in my favor. And that's where toxic masculinity comes from. Yeah. Because there's all these things that affirm what a man should be. And all of these things that denigrate what women are perceived to be. Right. And that's where that that disconnect takes place. And that's where that toxic thinking starts to starts to grow inside your head. But if you if you're about give in your relationship and not take, or at least to equal degrees, you mm-hmm. are in give and take mode. So you're giving to the to the extent that you're taking and vice versa and not not stepping over, especially in that second part. Because you don't want to become a taker. Because I've 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 been in relationships with, with, with takers and it's yeah. it's exhausting. Yeah. It is very, very exhausting. Um the ability to find that middle ground where everybody wants everyone else to be happy is very, very important. Oh yeah. But these are things again that don't that shouldn't have external opinions inserted into the mix. It needs to be between the people who are in that relationship. Yeah. Now, moving just for a couple of minutes away from the sexual part of this, that principle works in every other area of thought, reason, morality, whatever. The more middlemen you put in between you and your opinion or what you know is right, the more skewed the message gets. It becomes a game of telephone, okay? Yeah. Especially when you're listening to different Christians and their different attitudes on things. Because there are some militant, um, no physical contact before marriage types. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one of our professors was definitely one of those. Oh, yeah. And he was an older gentleman, and he said that he had never so much as held his wife's hand before they got married. I mean, there's there's something admirable about that level of self control, right? But I still, I mean, they they were married forever. Oh yeah, they so, were married. So for, in this instance, yeah. it worked. But right. we know full well that there are exceptions to the rule. Oh yeah, and this was a big one. Yeah, it was a big one. So I mean, I'm I'm perfectly fine with vignettes, but oh, yeah. don't try to normalize this because that's your experience. Right. You found the right person. Good for you. Yes. Not everybody finds them first time out of the gate. And that's why when you start adding legal contracts and wedding bans into the equation before you get a chance to know each other, then you don't know whether or not you found that person. You have no clue. Mm -hmm. You haven't had the time to suss out whether or not you can make what you and I have. We knew each other for four years yeah. before we got married. Mm-hmm. Okay. We didn't meet in September and get married over Christmas break. We took the time and sussed a few things out. And believe me, I'm pretty sure there were red flags on both sides. Yeah. I had some. You had some. We made what I think was probably a little bit of an irresponsible choice knowing what we knew about each other in certain instances. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that we we made the decision to get married for a lot of the wrong reasons. Yeah. It just so happens that we were right. Yeah. Okay. It was a total crapshoot. We were right yeah. about each other. But I mean, we were thinking about all the same things that everyone else our age thinks about when they're making those decisions. Yeah. And we were thinking about very little else. <laughs> and it really, really was a total crapshoot. There was, there was no way for me to be able to know that our relationship would be this. 30 years from now. There was absolutely no way to know. Okay. But we did take four years. We didn't dive into it. No. And I think that made a little bit of a difference. Yeah. But we still took our cues from other people for way, way, way too long. I mean, we, we were together almost every day, especially when school was in session. We were together every day, every single day. Yeah. And (laughs) saw each other at our best and our worst. Oh yeah. And Mm. I mean, Honestly, I really feel like you saw me at my worst in college because I don't think there was a whole hell of a lot that happened after that was that much worse until Liam came around. I mean, I was I was a shitty parent. I was not ready for that. And I had no support. But even then, I don't think that you saw anything that went above and beyond stuff that you saw earlier Mm -hmm. on. I mean, if there if there if there is, then, you know, that then 
then it is what it is. But we we I don't think that we ever got into any no. any major knockdown dragouts over my behavior or anything that uh, that was happening during that time. There's a lot of stress. Yeah. So when Liam was young, there's a lot of stress in this house. Uh huh. But we figured out a way past that too. Yeah. We figured out a way to keep loving each other through that, or more to the point, you figured out ways to keep loving me. Because there was a period of time there that I was really, really unlovable. Mm. And the fact that you stayed, it says a lot about how lucky we were. Yeah. When when we made the decision. I mean, to get there married. were a, a, there was a few years in there where maybe you know, I was not doing well or you were not doing well or just we were making each other unhappy for one reason or another. A lot of it was was maturity issues. I mean, we were young. We were young, and I stayed young for a while. I mean, just because I was extremely sheltered. And some of that was by choice, but some of it was because of where I was going to church and where I went to college. I mean, it was pretty much candy land. You know, it's like everything Mm -hmm. was covered in spun candy sugar. Everything was like... No, Jesus is the way. And <gasps> and the fairy tales that they told you about what life in the ministry was going to be oh, like. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was so much. when There was so much static that I can't even begin to imagine how I came to the decision to do nine-tenths of the things that I did anyway. Because I wasn't really thinking for myself. Yeah. Everyone else was thinking for me. Even down to when I was going to get married. Yeah. That was basically decreed by someone at Valley Forge and said, listen, if you want me to be able to place you, you need to tell these people you're getting married. And like, pronto. (laughs) And all the problems that that kind of thinking creates can be undone with just a few simple principles being applied. We've definitely got more than enough to work with here. There's going to be some stuff that comes out. I'm thinking about certain things and wondering just how much I, I want to really share at this point. And yeah. I'm going to see how much courage I have, what's going to stay. Yeah. But for right now, I just want to uh, I want to make, make a quick point at the end here, like I normally do, talking to people who are still part of this thing, trying to get out. Um, you, your, your, your life hasn't been given to you by anything external. I mean, your parents had sex and you're here, okay? So your life was given to you by them. But by the same token... They don't own you, okay? There's a real ownership aspect to being a Christian that has always bothered me, okay? They want to own everything about you. They want to own the way that you think. They want to own all of your behavior. And they sure as hell want to own who you decide you're going to love. The time has come to start thinking about what you want. And I've said this before. And I'm going to keep saying it because it's a point that needs to be hammered home. What you want matters. The person that you are matters. Your opinions matter. (laughs) Unless your opinion is, I should be allowed to murder people. Your opinion matters. As a species, we have evolved past that. We at least understand that that is black and white wrong. The problem with evangelical thinking is that everything is black and white wrong. There's sins and there's not sins. Mm. One thing I need you to understand is that there's no such thing as sin. Sin is a fictional concept. There's no such thing as sin. There are actions and consequences. And that's it. If you want good things to happen in your life, make good choices, and execute good actions. If you execute negative actions and you hurt people and you do things that go so against the societal grain that someone has to tell you to stop, that's where laws and governance come into play. Because, yeah, there are some people out there who would take full advantage of their ability to really make their own moral choices and they would do bad things with it the vast majority of people are not like that the vast majority of people simply want to be happy they simply want to live their lives without being harassed or having other people judge them for the lives that they live 
And if that's you, guess what? You're right to want these things. You're right to want your life to be yours. You're right to think that your decisions as to the things that you do, the activities that you engage in, the people that you love, whether it's the person or people, because guess what? It can be either. These things should be up to you and the other people that you involve in your behavior. And that's that. You don't need to look to externals. You don't need to look to any external aside from the other people that your actions impact. Those are the only people that you have to worry about. So that excludes your pastor, unless you're sleeping with your pastor. That includes all of your well-meaning friends who look at you funny because you do things in a slightly different way. Maybe you wear a little bit too much makeup for their taste, or they don't like your taste in jewelry, or they simply don't like the music that you listen to because it's not spiritual enough. I mean, I've been told that listening to secular music was a sin. I've been told a lot of things were sins that were just not somebody's cup of tea because what they want is for you to just agree with them and conform. Morality is not about conformity. Morality is about recognizing who you are as a person and developing a life around the things that you believe to be right. Wicca gets this really, really, really right. Don't hurt anybody else with what you do. Beyond that, do what you want. And that means sleeping with whoever you want to sleep with. That means doing what you want with your time and not going to church if you don't like going to church. It involves understanding that you have a responsibility to you. It involves developing a system of self-care that is predicated on things that make you happy, that make you feel more alive, that make you feel more you, and not on what some Bronze Age book has to say about your choices and about your tastes and about your preferences. If you're not hurting anybody else, then whatever you want to think about, do, say, whatever, within normal societal guidelines is perfectly okay. If you have thoughts about things that fly in the face of societal guidelines, let's talk about things like pedophilia. You know what? There are pedophiles that do not engage in pedophilic activity. Those thoughts are in there, but they don't act on them. It's a different area of sexuality than, say, homosexuality, because in that instance, you're dealing with a large group of individuals that have autonomy and can make decisions for themselves. With pedophilia, you don't have that. So you see where the difference is there when it's your decision and when it's not entirely your decision? In that instance, your decision is to not harm children. That's the moral choice that you are making. In other less drastic areas, it has to do with what's making you happy. If you aren't breaking any laws, if you aren't hurting anyone, if you aren't taking something from someone so that you can have it in a selfish way, then these choices should be and are yours. I don't know if anyone's ever told you this before, but yeah, the choice is yours. You get to decide what your life looks like. It's not predicated in a Bronze Age novel. It's not predicated on anything that your pastor or youth pastor has to say about what you should think of yourself and how you should present yourself. It has nothing to do with that. Look in the mirror and ask yourself, what things do I like? What things don't I like? I'll bet you dollars to donuts that the vast majority of things that you see in yourself that you don't like are predicated on things that you have been told are sins. And again, just ask yourself, okay, does this sin harm anyone else? Does it involve anyone else? And if it involves someone else, does it involve them in a positive way? And if you can reconcile all of that in your head, you don't need Bronze Age novels to tell you what's right because you already know what's right. You know that it is wrong to rape someone. You know it is wrong to kill someone. You know that it is wrong to take away somebody else's rights or liberties or anything. 
you know that it is wrong to impose on other people. You understand these things and you're right. You don't need someone else coming in here and, and telling you, okay, so based on what you know is right, you should do this, 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 and this. You already know. If you find someone you want to sleep with, sleep with them with consent, obviously, but don't, don't let these rules that have been pounded into your head since who knows when influence how happy you are as an adult. Okay. I mean, their, their own book kind of outs them. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put away all that greasy kid stuff. And you do not need your heavenly daddy's hand to hold here. Because with all due respect, there's nothing that you can learn from, from him about morality. There's nothing you can learn from the Bible about morality. Mm -mm. Because the morals in the Bible are so skewed and they are so varied that it just doesn't make any sense to even consider them. You don't need your heavenly father holding your hand. You need to break free and you need to start thinking for yourself because that is how you are going to get and stay unbound. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Unbound. Show topics are chosen based on their timeliness, relevance, and social impact. Have suggestions for future topics? Email us at unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com with all your comments and feedback. Please don't forget to like, share, and throw a few five-star ratings our way and follow us on all major social platforms. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Links to our social pages as well as a full list of cited sources in today's episode are listed in the show notes available at our website, getunbound.com. Org. That's get-unbound.org. If you value this resource and would like to see it continue, please consider supporting us on Patreon at the link in the show description. And be sure to check for new updates every Sunday when we'll come together again and take one more step toward getting and staying unbound.